um, we'll um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very brief sort of introduction and overview uh, over what we do um, here at SOAS and what the medical anthropology program is all about. Um, you know, maybe not taking more than maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then you get the floor, you get to ask uh, questions about the program. Now, I'm sure you've all seen um, the homepage. You have some information already at hand, but it, uh, it always makes a difference um, to see um, uh, the person who will be teaching uh, you in the end, uh, in this case, me, hello, um, Fabio Gigi. I'm uh, currently here lecturer in anthropology with reference to Japan, and I'm co-convening uh, the medical anthropology program together with uh, Dr. Orkide Beruzan, who is uh, currently on research leave, which is why she can't um, join us here today. Um, so I couldn't stop myself from bringing in something <laughs> very current. You can see on the image, um, this is something that is literally happening uh, at the moment. My specialty uh, is Japan. I've lived in Japan uh, for um, over eight years, all in all, um, uh, my first um, my first uh, uh, position, teaching position uh, and research position were both in in Japan. And so, yes, uh, if you're following the development of the um, uh, COVID-19 epidemic, and I hope you're all safely ensconced uh, wherever you are and washing your hands uh, regularly and religiously. Um, then you will uh, may have you may have come across uh, this little bit uh, of trivia. Uh, the Prime Minister of Japan declared a state of emergency uh, this morning, and it's quite interesting to see. I was in Tokyo until um, February um, this year, and uh, so the first cases already sort of uh, happened or the first uh, contagions happened in January. Um, but for some reason, Japan has maintained a, a, a very slow spread. So it's quite interesting from a medical anthropology perspective, of course, um, to look into that. Um, but one of the interesting thing of course, is also how people deal with it. And that's one of the core questions of medical anthropology. And so there was this uh, rediscovery of this strange creature, which you can see here, which is an amabie. Uh, which wasn't very well known, is a kind of, uh, 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 it's called a, a yokai, a monstrous uh, or strange or slightly supernatural appearance. And it was, uh, it first appeared at the beginning of the 19th century off the coast of Kumamoto. And apparently um, it said, you can see it's a, it's a kind of mermaid uh, type uh, figure. Um, uh, it said that uh, if you create a representation of me, that representation will be able to ward off epidemics. So very topical, right? And so if you go onto Japanese Twitter, you'll see uh, quite a few of these reinventions, sort of we can see on the right hand side here, a more modern form of the um, Amabie, uh, sort of as a, like a, a comic character rather. So very interesting to see that, of course, in a pandemic, the most important thing is the medical expertise and the epidemiologists, but there also are other streams of interpretation that helps us to make sense of what is happening. And some of these are, of course, religious. Some of these have to do with the supernatural uh, um, or any other kind of worldview that uh, inflects this. So I just wanted to bring this in as a sort of a current um, reference. So. Very broadly speaking, what is medical anthropology? I um, I expect you already have a sort of a, a broad idea what this is all about. But just to reiterate, uh, medical anthropology is a subdiscipline of cultural and so or social anthropology. The diff again, the distinction here is 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 really cultural in itself. Usually in America, um, what we do is called cultural anthropology, while in, uh, in in Britain it's called social anthropology. But they both mean the same thing, essentially the science of cultural difference. What is this difference? How does it constitute different ways of relating to the world? How does it explain humanity in its manifold um, appearances and expressions, right? 
So medical anthropology specifically then looks at individual, local and cultural understandings of illness and health and how these are related to historical and cultural differences. So you can see three levels already from the individual to the local, which means community, but in now in, in, in current terms can mean larger networks. You all know you're talking or I'm talking to you now. I'm in London. You may be at any other place um, in the world. And yet we sort of form a temporary community in which we share understandings of what it means to be uh, healthy and what it means to be ill, right? Um, and cultural understandings, again, there's a question of how large these entities are. Can we still speak of distinct cultures or in an age of globalization, do we have to look at the larger picture and to look at international streams, how certain understandings get imported from one place to another or conversely, how certain international understandings, uh, global health uh, for example, um, how what influence they have on the ground and how they are made sense of by, again, people in local settings, right? So three levels there, illness and health obviously being sort of the core uh, components of uh, the uh, interests that guide uh, medical anthropology. And then how these are related, uh, related to historical and cultural differences more broadly. So both cultural, which means synchronously at the same time, but also historically, because our understandings have grown historically. They come out of a particular context, they evolve, and then they move from one context to another. But each concept that we use, no matter how taken for granted it appears in daily life, has a history. And often we are not aware of this history. And so part of it is not only just thinking of illness or health understandings thereof um, as expressions of different cultural backgrounds, but it's also uh, something that you need to unpack historically. So moving on, and this is from uh, the um, American um, uh, Society for Medical Anthropology, which is part of the American Anthropological Association. Uh, this is sort of, you know, uh, one uh, attempt to um, visualize sort of many of the aspects um, that, um, you know, uh, the science, the discipline deals with. So you can see here, if what you're interested in, let's say, does not feature on this chart at all, maybe you're more interested in social anthropology or in any other um, MA program in anthropology. Um, but this is sort of, this is what um, a medical anthropology um, really is about. <coughs> Sorry, that's <coughs> hopefully not <laughs> a bad omen. Uh, everybody here in London is, is quite uh, nervous uh, at the moment, seeing what will happen uh, to our uh, prime minister. So yes. Um, yes. So. Another way of sort of trying to understand what um, medical anthropology is um, and how it is different from other forms of social science is to look at what kind of question that medical anthropology asks. And here are sort of three core questions that um, every medical anthropologist worth uh, their salt uh, must answer. And that's the question of power that looms very large in all of these. Um, and that's how, uh, that's why medical anthropology uh, is crucially linked to discourses of um, inequality and power differentials, right? So core question, who has the power to define what counts as healthy or sick, as normal and abnormal? And already you can see there is a projection of the first two terms, healthy or thick, onto the other ones, normal or abnormal, which leads to a very broad uh, set of questions uh, that are very relevant to anthropology, to sociology, to criminology, to any kind of social science. A question of how does a society define what is normal and what is abnormal? How do you understand what counts as healthy or sick? And of course, we 
anthropologists always emphasize that there are many different cultural understandings um, that differ in the way they define states of health or states of illness, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll see a few examples of that uh, later on, right? The second question, so this is sort of, this is a good part of the local the distribution of power, who gets to say what is pathological, who gets to say what is normal, and normal of course meaning good here, so there's an ethical uh, dimension of course always implied. So the second question then, how do structural inequalities shape, ind shape individual experiences of illness? Now this is sort of the core idea of critical medical anthropology, is to look on one hand at the individual understanding, at the very local, at the literally the micro ethnography. Ethnography is what we do, is field work, is meaning you embed yourself in a community, you live with them, uh, usually for a year if you do a PhD research, and you describe in minute detail what is happening. Everyday interaction, you try to understand what the taken for granted implicit meaning of the cultural uh, background is, and you try to describe this in as dense uh, a, a, a manner as possible, and this is uh, called thick descriptions, right? So you have that on one hand, but then you need to connect it to the larger question of why it is like that, and how larger um, global forces uh, impinge on individual situations and how inequality, power differentials, vulnerability is not equally distributed. It is very much in, it falls in line with other concepts in anthropology, with gender, ethnicity, or race. All these things come together to create a particular experience. And for anthropology, to be meaningful as a social science, we need to disentangle these different aspects. And then the last question, how are understandings of illness represented, transmitted and contested? That's the question of a mediation or representation. Uh, remember the first example of the Amabie, it's a representation of both something that is dangerous, the illness here represented, represented as a sort of supernatural being, but also it is, it contains in Nietzsche, uh, at its core, it contains uh, the cure, uh, in a sense, the representation of what ails you already allows you to distance yourself from it and sort of to, to, to create, to contain the threat. And that you have in many uh, medico-religious uh, discourses, the idea that representing something uh, correctly um, can have an alleviating effect, can help you get both a sense of psychological uh, security, but it also helps you deal in the real world. And of course, you could argue that in the current crisis, statistics are part of that, right? We read every day with dread the numbers of uh, people who die from COVID-19, uh, uh, and, and yet there is something about the numbers, there's something about the way that this allows us to ha have an understanding of the trajectory um, that also creates a sense of, of not uh, complete uh, control, of course, but uh, the unpredictability of the threat is alleviated, right? So representation, how these representations are transmitted from one context to another, and how they are contested. Uh, how often through grassroots movements uh, people come together and say this is representing us, we don't want to be uh, known as belonging to this category of people and therefore we change this perception. I'll just give you one example, um, there is uh, in the UK uh, a very interesting movement called the Hearing Voices Network and they are campaigning to remove hearing voices as a diagnostic category that uh, belongs to schizophrenia. As schizophrenia is a very complicated and very little understood uh, mental illness, but sort of the, the classical depiction is paranoid, uh, delusional, do you, ha you hear voices that tell you to do things. Um, and the Voices Network uh, essentially is a patient 
uh, or a client network, as they prefer to call it, um, of people who do uh, hear voices occasionally, but who are not suffering from schizophrenia. So they come together and they campaign for a better understanding, a better public understanding of what hearing voices actually um, means, right? And so there's an attempt, and that's you can say this is uh, they trying to contest the representation, the sort of the stereotypical representation of schizophrenia. If you're interested in that, you can simply Google uh, Hearing Voices Network, and the link uh, should come up. Right. So what is special about medical anthropology at SOAS? We, we call it med -anth. It's It's not very beautiful to look at, but I, I, I didn't have enough space on the PowerPoint because there's so many things that are very special uh, to SOAS. Uh, as you may know, there's also medical anthropology programs in very close uh, in our surroundings. Uh, there's uh, an MA in Global Health at uh, KCL, uh, King's College, uh, London, towards the Strand. Uh, UCL has uh, a medical uh, anthropology read, uh, which I, I was uh, uh, graduating um, from. Um, but what is special about what we do here? So there's, broadly speaking, three things. There's the regional expertise. Now, this doesn't mean that we only do these regions, but the sort of the three people who are involved in the degree program are specialized in these regions. So that's Iran and Middle East and North America for Orchidea Beruzan, uh, Japan and East Asia for me, and uh, South Asia and the UK for Professor David uh, Moss, who teaches the module Mind, Culture and Psychiatry, uh, which is um, sort of the other medical anthropology um, module that uh, we offer. So that's one thing. It doesn't mean that if you're interested in other regions of the world, uh, we want uh, you know, um, read and learn about them. Quite the opposite. We have actually an enormous um, broad spread um, of uh, regions on offer. But these are our research foci. So we are specializing in these areas. So regional expertise on the one side, thematic expertise on the other. And that's um, uh, very important uh, because medical anthropology, as any subdiscipline of anthropology, can be done uh, in a number of ways. And uh, at SOAS, we are very much aligned with the discourse of critical medical anthropology. So there's an emphasis on the global south, knowledge creation in the global south, uh, rather than just looking at you know at, uh, the latest uh, thing is coming out of uh, American or U America or Europe, um, but at the same time we are very all of us the three of us are interested in science and technology studies. So we're not just looking at indigenous notions of healing, uh, but we look at how modern technology changes the way we understand the human body, but also changes the way we understand personhood. What does it mean to be a person? How do we understand the individual? Is Are we open to others or are we conceived to be uh, very closed off and monadic, um, so to speak? And so that's uh, science and technology studies. And then um, broadly speaking, we take a very critical approach to psychiatry, biomedicine and global health. So it's we're a bit less gung-ho than the development people, you could say, about the idea of global health. We think there is it's, 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 it's uh, an important uh, movement uh, spearheaded by the WHO, uh, of course, but there are interesting uh, power dynamics that unfold when you take a sort of internationally agreed, which internationally agreed meaning agreed uh, by the medical bodies uh, in Europe and America, and then try to spread it uh, across the world and treating everything else as mere superstition, right? So we look at these critically, we look at uh, how knowledge is localized, uh, what happens uh, on the ground, uh, both in psychiatry and biomedicine and in the sort of global health discourse um, at large. Um, and then the third uh, the third point, synergy with SOAS as an institution, again, um, you can take a range of courses, which you can see if you go to the uh, website and you look at, um, I'm looking at it right now, um, looking at the uh, structure of the MA Anthropology degree, you can see the courses that you can choose. Um, and there's, of course, very lots of interesting things that you can do at SOAS. We have the greatest concentration of expertise in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia in Europe, used to be in the world. 
Yeah. Um, and we have a special focus on development and languages. So the institutional environment is also um, uh, very important, I think. So very briefly, just to introduce the uh, people who teach. So Dr. Orchide Berizan, she is the real thing because she is actually a doctor. I'm just a, a PhD in anthropology, which is also a doctor. But, well, I, I faint if I have to give blood. So, you know, as as a medical <laughs> practitioner, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 yes, you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't want to rely on me. But she she is the real thing. She did her um, uh, Dr. Matt um, in Tehran, a PhD in anthropology from uh, an anthropology and history from MIT. She taught at MIT University of Texas Medical Branch and King's College uh, London. And she's at SOAS since 2017. If you're interested in her work, she has run, written a wonderful book called Prozac Diaries, Psychiatry and Generational Memory in Iran. And that really gives you the perfect introduction to that course. So very briefly, I, I, want, you to, I want to give you enough time um, to, uh, uh, to, to ask questions. So just to give you a sense of what the content of the course actually is, these are the, this is the breakdown of the weekly sessions. Uh, so we have a core course. This core course is called um, uh, Medical Anthropology in Global Perspective. This is what you have to do as a medical anthropologist. And then there's modules that you can choose. Again, you can see uh, the modules on the list. So you do introduction, biomedicine as culture, which is important to point out because we tend to assume that, oh, there's medicine and then there's culture and medicine is actual science. So that's real and culture is just something made up. But actually that's, of course, uh, as anthropologists, we don't think that is the case, but more importantly, even uh, biomedicine has its culture it has its own way of looking at the world that is distinct from other ways and it's not because it's not distinct because it has a better access to reality so this this is sort of the first part of the course trying to destabilize certain assumptions that we automatically made um, then we have two sessions on medicalization medicalization being the process by which a social problem becomes a medical problem and uh, uh, orchidee will deal um, with the way that this has led to two different approaches in medical anthropology, interpre interpretative medical anthropology on one hand and critical medical anthropology on the other. Then there's a session on knowledge production in the global south, a film screening, a session on subjectivity, memory and social ruptures, and then regarding the pain of others, representation and refugee health, also a sort of a, a very um, topic at the moment. So. Orchidee teaches the first term. I will teach a core course the second term. My name is Fabi Gigi, as I said. Uh, my PhD is in social anthropology from UCL, just next door uh, to SOAS. Uh, my first job was as an assistant professor of sociology at Doshi University in Kyoto, and I've been at SOAS since 2013. I'm working on mental illness uh, and uh, more specifically on hoarding and disposal in Japan. Hoarding is, you know, when people can't throw things away. And I look at this from a very, uh, from also a partly science and technology kind of perspective, looking at how we deal with the stuff that's around us. So I'm both interested in medical anthropology, but also in material culture. And because of that material culture aspect, my uh, half of the term which you can see here sorry let's just say core course term two um is uh, slightly more focused towards materiality we look at how the body is commodified we look at organ transplantation and the different discourses that surround that if you if you if you're familiar with that you may have heard the expression the gift of life uh, which is sort of a discursive device to keep the organ itself from becoming a commodity which you can pay for uh, so trying to not create a market but of course the black market for uh, organs uh, that is also an international uh, kind of trade so we look at the many interesting and complex ironies of um, organ transplantation um, then sort of following the thread of materiality we look at the substances uh, blood and uh, semen and uh, everything else really look at kinship and biological citizenship of how these ideas have become uh, politicized and in what contexts 
Then we look at the body itself. We look at sex and gender. That's sort of an important uh, body that overlaps, of course, with the anthropology of gender. And then the second session looks at racialized and aestheticized the bodies, uh, trying to understand how being racialized, being perceived as belonging to a particular group or ethnicity uh, will change the way you relate to your body and other people will relate to it as well. But also looking at the burgeoning industry of cosmetic surgery, which often has uh, a sort of uh, not often talked about um, ethnic aspect. The people try to change their appearance in uh, line with certain expectations of beauty. And of course, these expectations themselves uh, are uh, culturally formed. Then uh, there's always a week, five weeks, then we have a reading week, and then we'll continue with the anthropology of sleep and dreams. This is one of my uh, favorite topics uh, at the moment. Um, we look at uh, why we sleep and how we sleep and what we dream and what to make of dreams as well. The session after that is technology of seeing. Uh, that is sort of a, a, a more science and technology kind of study. We look at the medical gaze and how um, looking inside the body has changed the way we think um, about ourselves. We look at the emerging new neurosciences of the brain that sort of provide us with a very different uh, notion of how to understand who we are as human beings. You know, it's no longer the soul, it's the brain in your head that makes you a person. And that has quite interesting and often unintended um, sort of ramifications. Uh, continuing with that, with the idea of the mind, we look at the substance of the mind, hallucinations and psychopharmacy, uh, how you can literally change your mind uh, with drugs and uh, uh, what happens and how we can understand what happens in these cases. This mostly with reference to Tanya Lerman's excellent uh, work. Uh, if you want to read something else, read Orchidea's uh, book, but uh, if you want to prepare, uh, and if you're interested, uh, uh, one excellent book to read is Tanya Lerman's um, When God Talks Back. It's a wonderful ethnographic uh, work on evangelical Christians in the US and how they understand their relationship with God. Speaking of which, um, next session, pain and suffering, uh, that uh, is, again, we take a phenomenological approach and you'll find out uh, what it means uh, in the session, uh, thinking about it in phenomenological meaning in subjective, but also in neurological terms. What is pain? What is a, a nociception? What, how do we perceive pain? How is pain created in the body? And how is it, again, distributed? How do we understand uh, pain as a state of being and what political ramification does that have? And the last session uh, is called AIDS and Global Epidemiologies, which looks at um, the uh, still ongoing AIDS crisis in the age of treatment. So there's a, a very interesting shift happening after uh, uh, HIV being HIV positive now is considered to be a, a chronic disease rather than a death feeling uh, illness. And that has, again, all kinds of ramifications for how people understand it, how stigma is reallocated and how we deal with life. Excellent. So sorry, that was quite long. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm open uh, for questions. Yes. I, I tend to speak slower when I'm in class, but it's just because <laughs> it's quite odd to speaking into the void. My neighbors must think I've gone mad.
That's a very good question. Um, truthfully, we don't know at the moment. Um, we are hoping, of course, that after the lockdown ends, um, that we will go back to normal over summer and that next term will start normally. But it's impossible to predict at the moment. If we are not able to go back, um, it will be taught um, online. But it's, I think, important to be on. It, I think it's very important to be, you know, it, it's possible to do it. And we've, I've taught the last, the end of uh, the last course that's still ongoing uh, online. But of course, it's always nicer to be in a room uh, together. Um, but yes, it's it's impossible to predict. Uh, it's planning to reopen, but um, the school has been very careful not to stoke too many hopes. Yes, please. Uh, you mean the uh, the material, the handbook? Ah, yeah. Ah, but but uh, see, the the what what we do is um, we do we do the um, we do it via Zoom. So it it is it, there's no recording um, of the course. It's just it it does happen live. The seminars. There, there, there are uh, some of the lectures are recorded, especially when the whole thing started. So I can I can send you a recording um, of one of the lectures. I just write down your name. Um, okay. Um, what 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 are you particularly interested in? <clears throat> okay 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 um i i i i i i choose one um a um uh, a representative one okay thank you Any other questions? Um, I divide chat. Ah, that's a good. So normally um, the MA dissertations um, are done in two ways. Either you do a sort of in-depth literature research, you develop a thesis and then you look at the current literature and you draw together and you can create your own argument. Um, the other possibility is to do fieldwork. And yes, you can do fieldwork, um, but it will be short term. Uh, so usually term three is used for that. So if you do a one year MA program, um, you, you, do, you start um, with the courses, two um, terms of coursework, and then literally now in spring, uh, you start developing your uh, dissertation project. And if you want to do fieldwork, you can do two or three months of fieldwork before coming back in summer and writing up. So there, there is the possibility, but it is quite a stressful experience. It's good to know um, very clearly and early on what you want to do. Then you can, uh, you can do fieldwork. Hello. 
Uh, hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Hello. Yeah, hi. I needed uh, to understand the how the assessments are going to be uh, taking place. I mean, are they subject to different or is it same? Is there some sort of a general examination for all of them? Because I remember reading uh, the course uh, description uh, where they have mentioned some of the courses are assessed through the essays or presentation or something yes. of that sort. So how how is the assessment? So there is no. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so there there is no big examination. Um, all the assessments for the core courses are via essay and book review. So after half of the course, you write a book review um, on a book of your choice. It's a full, should be a full length monograph. So an ethnographic monograph, you write a review, uh, which is a summary and a critique of the argument. That's the first piece of assessment. And then you have an essay that is due at the end of each term. So you write for the core course, you write two book reviews, one for each and two essays. And the essays are 2,500 word essays um, on a topic. And the topics are closely aligned with the sessions that we teach. So there will be one essay, a question about organ transplantation. There will be a question about uh, uh, international understandings of depression, uh, for example. And you do the reading and you show a draft to your supervisor and you write the essay. And that is the assessment. And then, of course, the biggest piece of work that is assessed is the MA dissertation. So there's no exam uh, aspect. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe I should I should add about the, the fieldwork question. Um, uh, of course, yes, you can do fieldwork. Um, but um, I, uh, I want you to bear in mind doing um, fieldwork in a medical institution, for example, is ethically very difficult, and it has become much more difficult with the new Data Protection Act. It's, it is possible, uh, but there is quite a lot of hoops to jump through, and uh, there's a whole ethics committee at school level that will be involved as well. So yes, you can do fieldwork, uh, but you have to think about it uh, carefully and prepare for it well. Any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, uh, my email address and re uh, reference email. I'll, I'll write this down just now. Um, the UK. So that's my email address. You can uh, ask all the questions uh, uh, that you have. Um, uh, just drop me an email. Um, there sometimes there will be. I won't be able to respond uh, immediately, um, but you know, uh, it sh I should get back uh, to you uh, within a week uh, or so. As for the question, can I conduct it outside of? Can, yes, yes, you can. Of course, you don't have to be in in England at all. But there's a, a limited amount of support that. Um, we can give. So you can conduct it outside of, you can conduct it anywhere um, in the world, but you will have to organize uh, much of it uh, yourself. I'm just saying this because if you do a PhD, for example, and you go for, for a fieldwork for one year, usually we try to create some kind of institutional affiliation, and that won't be uh, possible uh, for um, just uh, uh, so two or three months of fieldwork. So did, did you, uh, was, was there another question? Um, I, I saw a hand raised. Yes, OK. Yes, please. Hello. Hi, Hello. may I ask? Yes, uh, this is Akiko again. Um, so people who completed this uh, MA work, um, what are the um, like possibility if they wanted to go for a PhD? 
Um, I, there is um, quite a few people go into PhD programs. So this is um, one of the reasons why Orchidea and I devised the course uh, the way it is. We wanted to create a pathway to PhD programs. Uh, and so, so far, this has uh, worked quite well. Uh, we've had uh, students go on to do PhDs uh, in all different uh, parts of the world, um, some very successfully. Uh, so yes, this is, this is part of the idea. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, please, Jozana, is that, do, am I pronouncing this correctly? Hi, it's Jozana, it's, it's Jozana. Jozana, hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I had another question about the supervisors, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, how are they decided? Do we get to approach them or uh, there, is there some criteria on which we are selected by them? There, um, you can approach, um, if you have a particular person you want to work with, um, yes, but that it's not always possible to assign you to that person. Uh, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, one is you know, because we need to have some kind of equal distribution. Uh, but the other is also that uh, some I mean, people may be on research leave, right? You know, especially others of the department. But usually, if you're working on a, a project that uh, a professor is working on or is interested in, then automatically the MA tutor will assign you um, to that uh, person. So we can't always guarantee it, but usually it makes sense to, you know, to have people work with the supervisors that are suited to their interests. Yeah, that makes it clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any, any, uh, any more questions? So my, you, feel, you see my email um, on the site, fg5 at uh, um, uk. And so if you have any other questions, um, please um, uh, drop me an email. So thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, well, yes, I hope I uh, hope uh, I'll see you um, at some point. It's always nicer to meet, you know, at an open day or an inside day, and actually, you know, to walk around the buildings to get a sense of the atmosphere and so on. But um, yes, sadly, um, that's uh, not really possible at the moment. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. I'm not quite sure. It's like uh, I, I don't know. Maybe because there, there is, there is a SOAS moderator who is is uh, organizing these, and um, so yeah, it's like I would say. Well, if you, you know, if you have to go somewhere, feel free to leave. Um, oh, and I see SOAS events left the session. So I think yes, I think we are pretty much. <laughs> well, I guess that's it then. If you don't have an urgent question right now, then we say, um, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. It's great seeing you too. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, take care. Uh, you know, don't go outside too much and 
wash your hands. That's all I can say for the moment. So thank you very much and goodbye.